Hey, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for this discussion forum this afternoon on important risk management considerations as we look to reopen schools. I'm Tasha Davenport, Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operations Officer for CASBO. And I'm joined today by Sarah Baches, our CAS CASBO's Chief Governmental Relations Officer. And also we've got a couple special guests from the field, uh, Jennifer McCain, who's CASBO's Risk Management Professional Council Chair. And she's also the risk manager for Schools, Innova Schools Insurance Authority. So SIA, I think we know them as. So thank you, Jennifer, for joining. And we also have Judy Miller. She's the co-chair of that Risk Management Professional Council. And Judy is the director of risk management and environmental safety for Paris Union High School. Thank you again for joining us. Just to sort of put together a framework uh, before we jump into the conversation, because of the great work that our legislative advocacy team has done, Sarah and Elizabeth Esquivel from our governmental relations team, and then our members, right, our leader members, uh, because of their great work, we have been invited to some very important conversations uh, that are all focused on reopening schools. And I'm gonna just sort of set the table for a moment on those. The first is the management organizations. Uh, the, the alphabet soup, if you will, of associations with CSBA, uh, ourselves, Access, Small School District Association, and CSESA. And the leaders, uh, as we talk, you know, a couple of nights a week on our calls, uh, we are really unified in our mission to not have a situation where the tail is wagging the dog, but rather to capture insight, the complexity, uh, the, the cost associated with gather information and inform the policymakers at the Capitol versus the reverse happening. And so those organizations that I mentioned are working very closely together uh, to make sure that we are representing uh, the needs in order to make this all a reality. The second meeting is with the governor's office. And those were nightly. We've kind of moved those, I think, two nights a week. Uh, really along the same lines, um, probably a little bit more um, education is needed uh, at times and really trying to get ahead of some of these executive orders, trying to minimize the um, minimize the off the cuff sort of comments like we'll open schools in July and you know, not having an understanding of the impact that that might have. Um, and and so that that call with the governor's office to again, make sure that they really understand all the implications of some of the decisions that they're tr trying and attempting to make. And then the third, the uh, superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, has also started task force. Uh, we had about, um, I don't know, 30 agencies on that first call, the unions, as well as all the management groups, uh, certainly CDE is a part of these conversations. Um, but again, it's what is it going to take to make this happen? And so our aim in all of our work, again, is to hear from you, uh, understanding that smalls might be different than urbans and suburbans and the large, but hear from you your questions. Uh, we do not have the answers. We're not sitting here pretending to today. Uh, we will inform on a couple of things that we are getting clear on as we go through these conversations, which truly are every day. We're in one of those three conversations every day of the week. Um, so we wanna hear from you. We want to use that information to inform, as I mentioned, and then we also are capturing that, uh, and Sarah and her team will be analyzing this to understand any of these uniquenesses between the different types of districts that we have and turning that back to you um, as we get clarity with best practices, uh, checklists, toolkits to help you once we know what the rules of the game are, right? We're all waiting for the rules of the game. What's the money gonna look like on May 14th? And you know, we, we won't go into all the different considerations that have already been shared, but as we meet with each one of our professional councils, you know, transportation, child nutrition, obviously today, risk management, maintenance and operate, that, you know, it's such a complicated topic. So uh, with that said, you know, just kind of taking a look at um, this next slide, we understand that there are different models being explored with the schools. We heard on our last call, that uh, with maintenance and operations. We heard in our last call that, you know, one group is thinking of doing, you know, a morning schedule, and then they have got this massive cleaning and flipping of the facility, if you will, sanitation, and then they would have an afternoon schedule. 
and they're struggling with how, how we get that done. We have a lot of schools looking at, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then the students are Tuesday, Thursday, the next and rotating in that way. Uh, we see other co countries open with their uh, younger grades first, you know, uh, K through third, uh, they're kind of, and then migrating the, the older in as they go. So lots of different models, lots of different, you know, districts will have a, a different approach to this, but regardless of the model or the option, all of these areas have to be considered. And that's really what we've been moving through with hundreds of folks participating in conversations over the last week with us. Um, what, what do all of these areas, what is the effect on all of these areas? So uh, one is just to, again, capture your information. And then the next is to analyze that information and plug it into key buckets that we're using again in, in informing. And those buckets are the policy and funding that look like, uh, you know, we, we all are clear there's a new model that's probably needed. That's not ADA, it's probably, you know, something different than that. So Sarah and her team are pushing hard for that. What's continuity of learning look like, conditions of learning, and then leadership and planning. And so that's kind of the, the outcomes as we gather this information, we intend to, again, share back. Um, and then, you know, a, a, a never ending effort that started far before all of this was how do we advocate for sufficient funding, um, legislative and regulatory areas of relief and flexibility. Um, you know, in some cases we have a uh, federal law that is um, lighter, if you will, than California law. And one of the things we do know right now is that we see a, um, you know, a lot of lawyers lining up and a lot of uh, litigation happening or threatening to happen. And, and so we're really trying to get ahead of this on all fronts. So um, just with that as the introduction, again, it's a listening session. Uh, we've had so many great questions on the calls that we've had. Many we won't have the answer. We're going to thank you for submitting that question and we will find the answer. We've got transcripts of this. So we'll be getting back to the whole group and the whole population, even folks that are not on the call today. So with that, I would like to turn it over to the folks that are experts in the area of risk management, uh, uh, both uh, Jennifer and Judy, to share your perspectives on you know, what you're considering. And, and by the way, compliments to you, these ladies pulled together a team of folks, I want to say it was 17 people, like two weeks ago, and are very far down the path. So thank you for the work you've already done and for taking the time to be with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tasha. Um, yeah, and you are correct. It is about 17 people that we have currently on this team. Um, and just to um, give a little bit of an introduction as to why, one of the things that we recognize on the Risk Management Professional Council is that there is a lack of school risk management guidance at the state level. There isn't a risk management person at the CDE, for example. Um, and so we wanted to do what we can through this CASBO State Risk Management PC to provide as much guidance as support um, as we possibly can for all of you. And um, we started talking about how we might be able to do that. And the project that we have currently in place is to put together a set of best practices that um, should be considered or can be considered as you move forward through COVID and also as you um, consider reopening your school sites. What might that look like? Are we looking at reopening, but only with virtual classes? Are we looking at reopening with a hybrid model in, um, in the fall? Or, um, you know, or are we looking at schools that might actually be able to reopen in, in counties and local areas where there are minimal or no cases of COVID? Um, and in all of those situations, we need to be prepared for addressing COVID as we continue um, through the second and, and potentially third wave of this disease. Um, so some of the best practice categories that we are working towards right now um, would include, for example, employee safety practices and personal protective equipment. Um, you know, where can you get equipment? What kinds of equipment should you be providing and for which employees, um, depending upon the work that they do? Of cleaning practices, equipment and supplies where that um, where those supplies might become available and which cleaners are, for example, um, approved or, or determined to be COVID effective. Um, and then looking at specific operational areas, food services and providing meals, um, especially right now as we try to do this while schools are closed. 
uh, purchasing and warehouse, um, sending out and also receiving, and how do we route traffic so that we are um, in, avoiding uh, conglomerating people into one area? Uh, maintenance and operations, um, and of course, other areas as well. Um, and then we're looking at uh, where you might have public facing people. So, uh, you know, one of my um, pieces of advice to you at this time is to think of yourself as a, a customer service organization. You have employees that provide that service and you have um, customers, which include your students and your community. And then consider the other customer service organizations we're seeing right now. How are they successfully, um, or at least to the best of their ability, navigating this situation? Um, and I'll give you an example. If you look at your grocery stores, you're probably seeing um, customer service agents that are protected by plexiglass panels and um, for whom sanitizing um, uh, agents are, are made available on their counters and, and their work areas for everybody that they come near. Are we thinking along those lines when we consider um, reopening our offices, for example, to the public or when we're considering how we're delivering our, our food services? One piece of guidance I'd like to provide, and I believe Tasha will have these links available through the presentation, um, is that the Cushman Wakefield uh, Property Management and Realty Company has um, put together a very thorough, comprehensive, um, and thought provoking uh, set of guidance. There is an entire guide that can be downloaded from their website, and there is a, a simple single page checklist that's called the Safe Six for workplace readiness essentials. And it is entirely geared around reopening your schools or reopening any, any facility or business. Um, the six categories include topics like preparing your building and they get into specific steps that you can take if you've had a building that has been sitting empty. How might you look at your HVAC systems to make sure that they've been properly cleaned and sanitized or um, how might you engage vendors that are returning to your campuses, for example. Um, so step two would include how to prepare your workforce or your, your specific employees. Um, three is controlling access, and that's looking at where do you have entrances and exits and how do you route traffic flow through those areas to, again, keep people from passing by one another, but perhaps um, moving in same directions so that they can maintain that six foot of social distancing which is step four, creating a social distancing plan. How do you set up your work areas? And in our case, that's going to include classrooms. How do we set up classrooms so that we can maintain social distancing? They have a, a document they call the six foot office, and it is how to physically design an office to again, route traffic flowing and um, identify a six foot space around individual work areas so that it becomes visually very easy to understand where you can and should move and where you can and should not move. Uh, step five would be reducing those touch points and increasing your cleaning wherever possible. So, for example, you might purchase automated equipment to, um, uh, you know, for your hand washing areas so that people don't have to touch those areas. Uh, that would help to eliminate the exposure there, but where you can't purchase that, how are you going to increase your cleaning schedule so that you can frequently clean those high touch points? And their sixth and final step, which I think is going to be a very important one, is really communication. And we know that people in the absence of information will come up with their own explanations for what they think is happening. So I would say you want to communicate what your plan is, even if your plan is in the early stages. Start communicating with your community and your employees that you are working on a plan, that you are developing strategies, that you have taken some of these things into consideration. Communicate out your need to hear from them, much like CASBO is doing right now, about concerns that they may have. It's possible that you're going to hear um, uh, objections that haven't come to your attention yet that you do want to address and you want to hear about those sooner than later. And I believe Judy is going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that they've used in her district. Is that correct? Yes, and Jennifer, before Judy jumps in, I just wanted to mention that we do have all of your resources at the end of this presentation, uh, the links that you shared. So everyone will, will be able to take, uh, take advantage and, and see those great resources. Thank you. So over to you, Judy. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit. And I have to tell you that um, it's just a pleasure to work with such a good group of people who no one has all the answers, like we said earlier. Every district is different. 
Um, ours has been really driven by MOUs that HR has been working with um, the bargaining units uh, with. And so we've been kind of coming in and, okay, now how can we implement the, kind of some of the agreements? So sometimes you have input on that, sometimes you don't. Um, and so I think collectively, we've all got really good experience that we can share. So um, when a lot of this stuff, when I go down those lists and what we've been working on, one of the things that um, in this group talk about also the remote working and remote working, teaching and learning and some of the ergonomic pieces of it. So some of the things for us to address teachers, we wanted to make sure staff who are um, working from home had access to the same equipment they had in their office. Of course, not keyboard trays that are attached to their desk, but they were able to check out um, monitors, keyboards, um, mice, that type of thing. Um, sanitation cleaning was is a huge piece of it. We were already in the process of converting to electrostatic sprayers, which is a really fantastic application method. Right in the middle of this, then, of course, some of the stuff that we had ordered became back ordered. So it's interesting. I know a lot of us are in the same boat with equipment and um, supplies. So, but we have enough of them that we're able to do um, at least the essential areas that the, where essential workers are working. So we have electrostatic sprayers. I know that's where right now we're working on a kind of a, a test protocol so we can really nail that system and that process down for when we everybody returns. Um, Food service is one of the first things we had to look at and what that in and how that worked even ergonomically, but also creating distance between our um, our staff and the public. I know we went and visited other districts. Some of them had um, cars driving up and they put it in their trunk. Some of them had people coming out of their cars and put on a table. You know, so we've done we worked with our staff and kind of created that the distance with a, 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 a tight adjustable table, you know and then they slide a tray across to the public. So I think a lot of the mindset is people are understanding the distancing. The um, In our county, we have probably, we're one of the higher counties as far as numbers of cases and numbers of deaths in the state. And so in our county, our um, public health officer has, it's mandatory that everywhere everyone wears face coverings. And so when that order came out, we had some surgical masks, we deployed those. Two days later, now it's face coverings and they're discouraging the use of surgical masks for N95. So we were able to buy bandanas, we offered those. Um, so now we've got a choice between bandanas and some surgical masks. We're trying to hopefully have some supply left when this is, when we start um, bringing more people back on, on campus. But, um, you know, this, this whole big picture, we're also working on virtual graduations and how in, with all the distance learning. So I think everyone's in the same boat with, you know, how they're deploying distance learning, how are we making sure people are safe when they're working at home and giving them some ideas and tips on setting up their workstations, having essential workers come in and um, keeping them, you know, with, uh, we if we have too many in, in one office that have to come in a day, we try to rotate them so we don't have too many people in the same area. And then, then they're wearing face coverings and, and rotating on what days they come in. I think a lot of us are in that kind of that same, situation. Um, hand sanitizers, equipment, PPE, um, all of us have some, um, I, I probably everyone has something on back order. So that's that's the logistics of getting stuff in. And I know Tasha, you talked about um, just helping the, the legislature understand all these um, kind of challenges that we all have as far as how, how when we do come back, what is that gonna look like and how are we gonna source um, what's going to be asked of us to to manage and so um now i'm now i'm trying to think okay so that's kind of what we've been doing all that stuff we're just trying to make it one thing i'm working on now i'm really concerned about i call it work hardening i'm not sure if that's the right term but in our district we have custodial maintenance um, ground staff they're being rotated in just two days a week and for like a five hour shift or until they get um Right now, they're just mainly covering our meal service and they're covering just so things don't get too overgrown on the campus, but we really don't, they're not working that, that much. And so I'm working with some local physical therapists and I've reached out to our JPA and our TPA, like what are some resources that we can use? How, what's gonna look like when staff come back to an eight hour a day job and it's hot, they have, we haven't been acclimated to the heat. 
And so I'm looking at I'm looking ahead at those types of things as well as not just the equipment and the supplies and the procedures, but also staff and and then dealing with the staff that might still be in those higher higher risk categories. And also just the like Jennifer said, the communication is going to be critical because of um, you know they're, they're the fear and the uh, and the unknown of what what we're what we what we're up against with the virus. I can think of something else. That's that's really you know. So I I mean just in general, there's just lots of pieces to it. And um, I think I don't think I came up with anything new. Um, but just looking ahead, that's some of the stuff that we're working on. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer and Judy. I think our our goal really is to have a voice and to ha make our members feel heard that we're in this together, that it really is, it's challenging times and we're entering on an own territory. Uh, and, and really it was precipitated by comments made um, last Tuesday when Governor Newsom made an announcement that uh, schools can reopen as early as July and August. Uh, and so the governor released his plan about a four stage approach to a roadmap. Um, it lacked a lot of details in terms of how schools fit into stage two. Uh, but one of the criteria that was mentioned at the state level, it requires stabilization, hospitalization, not that it would require a, a sufficient protective equipment being in supply, as well as sufficient testing capacities to meet the demand and the ability for the st state to trace contact. And so it, it, it really is important that we be part of the conversation, that we be, be, uh, be a leader and, and a voice in ensuring that as the state begins conversations of reopening schools, they recognize the context that we're in. The governor is expected to release the May revision next Thursday. And we understand that uh, unfortunately due to high unemployment because of COVID-19, uh, we will see a decrease, a significant decrease in revenues. We, at this time, don't have much more information of how significant that is. And so in that environment, how do we prepare? How do we support you? And how do we ensure that we have the Uh, is that CASBO is working to coordinate efforts at the state, federal, and local levels to ensure that guidance and partnership is uh, consistent. CASBO is working to mitigate any of the potential impact of ADA loss and push for an alternative reporting system since that is how schools are uh, attain their uh, general fund sources and create a roadmap to reopening that accounts for the diversity that is our California school system that allows for an opportunity to share best practices, which is why we really felt the need to create these forums for as many of our professional councils. At this time, we want to open the floor uh, by asking those that are in our forum uh, to use the icon of the little hand. Uh, that's how you sign up to speak or comment. You're also welcome to enter your question in the Q&A box. Our goal really is to seek uh, information on how we could support you, guidance that you need, information that needs clarification, and any information that we can relay to the legislators that are have returned back to Sacramento to deliberate on the state budget, to the governor's office as they piece together uh, the 2020-21 budget and the Department of Education and State Board that are responsible for their regulatory process. We do believe that your voice is critical in all of these conversations and we wanna ensure that you are heard uh, with that, I'll turn it to Christina to see if anyone has raised their hand to speak or entered a question in the question box. Thank you so much. At this time, the floor is open. Wonderful. 
Well, I have a question on the floor from Kurt Walling. Kurt, would you like to speak to your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. So, you know, obviously, right now, folks that are working in the medical and and EMS fields, so, uh, I think they have a, a valid claim for presumption when it comes to work comp. But what about all like, the teachers and and the uh, uh, food service workers and, and all the folks that have been handing those meals out and you know interacting with the community throughout this time and then when we go back to school because that could crush work comp programs uh, is that something that's being discussed yes uh, caspa was able to relay a letter to the administration along with our cities counties uh, special districts on this particular issue uh, we want to make sure that documentation is still required for any comp uh, workers comp cases we do not want to see any of uh, anything flux uh, because then that really does open pandora's box where the uh, it, it, the lea would not have an opportunity to ensure that it was um, that it meets the standard of current law uh, so those are conversations that have been taking place directly with administration to really help them understand how all of our finances are really tied together with our salaries and benefits and our compensation structure and that any and and so we do know that there are this is an issue that continues to be raised by uh, union associations it's something that they have raised in the past and so we were able to get ahead of it and start communications with the administration two weeks ago on this very topic Thank you, Sarah. Uh, panelist, uh, Judy, floor is yours. Uh, you know what, I was going to look it up. I just heard um, maybe an hour ago, the governor did announce that um, I think there's a 60 day kind of a window going back to, I think sometime in March about, I don't know if you call it a presumption, but it certainly sounded like he was opening the door a lot wider on the work comp side. And so I haven't had a time I haven't had a chance to read it, but I, it's certainly concerning. So I'm not sure if anyone had um, read that, but I would um, encourage everyone to go back and see what the governor just said about work comp. And it didn't sound like it was specific to, you know, healthcare and first responders. I think it sound, I think he was directing it to any essential workers. So that could mean any of our staff who could have been exposed anywhere, but because they're essential workers, it sounds like he might be opening that up. So that's gonna, that will definitely, um be challenging if we start getting those types of claims in correct and so that comment was in regards to pro uh, paying property taxes yes at noon and uh it's always fun to try to follow everything that happens at noon in sacramento um it, it's a, a delaying penalties for anyone who can't pay property taxes until next may uh, that was another letter that various cities, counties, and CASBO sign on to the administration, letting them know that LEAs gener rely also on property taxes. And so what I, what I was informed is that we still haven't seen the details. Uh, the executive order is coming maybe later in a few hours. I, I, ours relating to um, to the delay in paying for property taxes, that there would be uh, specific uh, requirements of the people that would be able to delay their payments. Thank yes. you. Oh, I'm sorry. Also expands workers' comp, so it's. Um... can't hear anything. I thought I had Judy on the line. It's possible she lost. Um, we've had a few comments in the in the Q&A box regarding uh, the workers comp. Um, Gabby has commented, I thought the announcement by the governor did include presumption for all essential workers. I don't think there were any exclusions. Once we get that information, we'll relay it through a news break. Um, and clearly things are are coming at us every day. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, the floor is open.
So if we don't have any questions at this time, uh, we did want to show you that we have uh, been compiling uh, various links and resources that will be included in our PowerPoint presentation. Any future conversations or discussions, uh, please make sure to feel free to email me directly at sbaches at casbo.org under topic reopening schools. Our goal is really to ensure that your voice is part of all of these conversations that we have. Um, we know that there's more questions at this time, but we really are interested in making sure that we could provide the best support possible given the uncertainty of the times. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.